Okay, my friends, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to speak to you about this film in detail. And to do that, I have to spoil the film. So if you have not seen the film, The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On, I strongly encourage you to stop this video and you can uh, turn it off and then watch this film, try to find it. And then when you've seen the film, you can come back to this video and then we can have a discussion about this very powerful documentary by the great filmmaker Kazuo Hara. This is The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On. Okay, so you're still here. So let's have just a brief discussion about this. So as I alluded to earlier, uh, the focus of this film is primarily this very um, complex individual named uh, Kenzo Okazaki and his basically following him, uh, we see, we understand that he was a former soldier in the Japanese army and he was also captured in New Guinea. And because of his capture, he essentially, according to his own account, was able to avoid certain uh, very intense moments that befell his other uh, fellow soldiers in the Japanese army in the New Guinea area. And now he is much older. He is in his early 60s at the time this film is being, being shot. And so we see him go through these acts that are uh, essentially acts of, of um, uh, uh, they are antisocial acts in the sense that he is expressing certain concepts and certain ideas that would be seen or would be considered to be um, against the norm. So what do I mean by this? So for instance, he is seen to be driving a car that has uh, printed in very large lettering, you know, to kill uh, Kakue Tanaka, who is at the time the f a former prime minister of Japan. And it's not made clear in the film, but in fact, uh, he, Okuzaki, published a book called Proclamation to Kill uh, Kakue Tanaka. And so this is, I think, part of that. Um, uh, it's almost like publicity for his book in a sense, at least according to Hara in his production notes. And so that is one act that he seemed to be a very, uh, what's, what's a phrase, like a social renegade perhaps. But also uh, with that, or perhaps related to that, is his uh, focus on the emperor and his hatred of the emperor. And according to Okazaki, this is because, in a sense, that the emperor was the supreme commander of the Japanese army during the Second World War, the Pacific War. And it was during this time that Okazaki understands that certain acts of murder, essentially, or death, or unnatural deaths, uh, occurred uh, with respect to certain soldiers, uh, some of whom were his own um, a fellow uh, soldier uh, comrades. And so we follow, therefore, Okazaki uh, on these uh, excursions or episodes. So first he visits the, the mother of one of his um, uh, fellow soldiers who died, and uh, this is Shimamoto. And we also see Okazaki visiting the graves of uh, the dead soldiers. Um, it's uh, Shimamoto, and he's visiting the grave with his mother, um, and also um, uh, he's seen visiting uh, the graves of other uh, shrines of other dead soldiers. He's also seen visiting uh, someone in the hospital in um, uh, just north of Tokyo, and uh, he's a very uh, looking like a very frail man and we later find out that this man was ex-sergeant um, Yamada and he's in the hospital for some illness and we also later find out that he was uh, one of the only survivors of the 36th regiment along with Okuzaki and so Okuzaki visits him and according to the production notes Okuzaki and Yamada were actually um, uh, very cordial at first, and uh, Okuzaki would visit Yamada very often in the hospital. But then when we see Okuzaki visiting Yamada as part of the film, we 
sense something very frightening about Okuzaki's character. Uh, he essentially says that uh, he is very happy that o Yamada is being, he's ill and he's going through this state because he th considers it to be a kind of divine retribution uh, for the sins or the, the acts of, um, the acts that he thinks that Yamada committed during the war. So this is actually quite shocking because we see here a glimpse of Okuzaki's character and also his approach. He has a kind of no-holds-bar approach or attitude. He is relentless. He doesn't care if uh, the person that he's talking to is uh, in, you know, in a hospital bed. Um, he will just relentlessly pursue what it is he wants to pursue until he gets at some answer uh, or he, he gets some kind of um, uh, thing that he wants. For with Yamada, which is very interesting, what we understand Okuzaki wants is he wants Yamada to accompany him to New Guinea and uh, there will be some kind of ceremony or something to be had in New Guinea, which is the place where, of course, they fought in the war. We also later find out that uh, Okuzaki wants to take the frail mother of one of the dead soldiers, uh, Shimamoto. She, he wants to take her as well to New Guinea and have her take part in whatever it is that Okuzaki has in mind. It's a actually uh, very, uh, it's a very interesting setup, right? Um, and in fact, we don't ever see this group go to New Guinea. And in fact, we never even see any footage from New Guinea. Uh, as we see later at the very end, we understand that the crew actually did go to New Guinea and there was some footage shot in New Guinea. But, um, uh, you know, uh, it was confiscated uh, by the Indonesian authorities. Uh, so the footage was not it was essentially lost, and so uh, the footage was not able to be put into the final film product, which is a shame. If you want to find out uh, an account of what happened in uh, New Guinea, um, then or Indonesia, then you can uh, check out the production notes here, because the production notes actually go through uh, Hara's diary and Hara's account of what happened uh, here. And so... Um, uh, if you want a, an account of what happened in uh, during the the trip to Indonesia, uh, you should really check it out. It's really fascinating, uh, really fascinating. But that is just one aspect of of Okuzaki's approach, and we see this played out here at the very beginning. Uh, it's quite shocking, but as the film progresses, as you know, these tactics turn more physical and more violent. And in fact, later. Uh, towards the maybe the last 20 minutes or so when we are seen uh, when we see Okuzaki once again visit Yamada this time in his house we see Yamada is still frail because he's just left the hospital but uh, Okuzaki is relentless is trying to figure out what happened uh, with respect to the death of a certain soldier whose name is Hashimoto and so uh, uh, Okuzaki is seen he won't stop until he gets some kind of truth or answer from Yamada and first Yamada is resistant to tell him what happened but Okuzaki is so insistent that he is physical with him he, he fights with him he kicks him and this is an old man a frail man who's who's ill uh, but once that happens and the police come and there is a commotion and the family come in and try to protect Yamada but to no avail you know, it essentially breaks down and we see in its essence what is almost like a confession of what Yamada knew about the circumstances surrounding the death of this particular soldier, Hashimoto, in this, in the, this group of, of five survivors that were dwindled down. And it's a frightening story that uh, Yamada is, is seen being uh, uh, telling about. But the, this aspect of Okuzaki's approach makes this film very complicated and quite difficult to watch because not only are we seeing uh, Okuzaki uh, 
acting in this very threatening way, an almost violent way, not almost a violent way in order to get at what he considers to be um, the means uh, or the end to his means, right? Uh, He wants to get at the truth. That's what he claims he wants, but he will stop at nothing to do it, and he will use physical uh, force in order to exert uh, his control over someone, uh, thus to get to that person to tell him what happened. That's what he wants, but uh, there are consequences to his actions, uh, he, and he seems to appreciate that, and so he, we see him act this way, um, which is very disturbing on many levels. It is also disturbing to hear the the result of this, which is namely Yamada's story about the war and what happened to this soldier Hashimoto and elements of cannibalism that came in, and uh, it becomes a very uh, deeply disturbing story of an atrocity. But we are also given, I think, a, an extra element of, of being disturbed, namely we understand that the film is being made, the camera is still rolling, we, the camera is, is fixated on Okazaki as he's essentially beating up this old man. The filmmaker doesn't stop to stop the fighting, he doesn't put the camera down or anything, he lets the camera roll. And this is Hara. This, I think, gets into one of the most fascinating aspects of this film, which is the filmmaker and the filmmaker's morals and the moral ground upon which the filmmaker stands as he is making this film, or as the filmmakers are making this film. And Hara, I think, alludes to this uh, this issue, I think, quite eloquently in his production notes here. And essentially what we're dealing with is that he is basically filming scenes of Okuzaki, and he's not only seen uh, attacking Yamada, but earlier on in the film, what in the middle part of the film, which is dealing with the, the deaths of the two other soldiers, um, um, and the fact that they were executed uh, by um, order, uh, and the Okazaki is is trying to question all the the officers that were involved with this execution uh, in order to try and find out the truth about what happened. Um, the soldiers are Nomura and uh, Yoshizawa. So these two were apparently shot for whatever reason, and we later find out, according to the accounts of these various uh, officers, what happened, uh, or what they said happened. And uh, so during this account, remember Okazaki is seen visiting the one of the ex-sergeants whose name is Yukio Seo. And Yukio Seo is essentially very resistant and trying to give him any information but then during the middle of the questioning Okazaki essentially attacks him and we see him uh, just uh, over sail and, and essentially assaulting him uh, not soon after of course uh, other people come to Seo's defense and then they uh, subdue uh, Okazaki and they turn the tables on him so it's, so then it becomes Okazaki on the floor and, and he's, he's being overcome by a number of people trying to stop him uh, but the camera is still rolling while all this chaos is erupting. Uh, the camera crew, uh, the crew doesn't stop and, and try to stop and intervene in the fight. No, it just keeps going on. And so this, I think, goes into a, a certain complexity about what it is we are seeing and the, and the issue of whether the filmmakers can be said to be uh, engaging in certain uh, approaches that are... are are um, okay or that might be considered to be questionable. Again, I must direct you to Hara's comments about this particular scene with Seo, uh, and he talks about it in the production notes very eloquently. Uh, the fact that um, you know he didn't know what was going on and the fact that Okazaki himself was a very volatile uh, individual, at least according to Hara and his, uh, based on his interactions with him. Also, specifically with the scene with Seo, where he is seen attacking, first attacking him, and then Seo is overcoming Okazaki with the help of other people, his neighbors. Um, Apparently, according to the production notes, it's not shown in the film, but Okazaki afterwards was very, very upset because uh, he 
was very angry at Hara for not helping him. Uh, he was very angry at Hara because he, Okazaki felt that this was showing um, Okazaki in a very weak light. You know, he was being overcome. He wanted to be the hero. He wanted to be the main star of the film almost. And to see him in this uh, s situation of weakness was uh, almost an unforgivable act uh, from Okazaki's point of view. And so this also is uh, suggestive of the fact that there are elements here which show or which uh, strongly suggest that Okazaki is putting on an act. These are uh, public shows. These, this is almost like Okazaki trying to create a film that is uh, propagating or propaganda uh, of his own actions and trying to glorify his own actions. But when the tables are turned, he's very uncomfortable. He doesn't like this. So uh, this is to say that if you are looking at this film and questioning uh, the sort of moral ambiguity grounds that you might think the filmmaker is on or the sort of complicity that you think the filmmaker might be treading on, I would also urge you to look at these notes, but also I would urge you to consider that based on the notes and based on certain nuances and suggestions that are made in the film, I think the relationship between filmmaker and subject, Hara and Okazaki, is much more complicated. And in fact, there is a great deal of tension and um, perhaps even discord between the two. So much discord to the fact that uh, there are certain other aspects of the production of the film that are not shown in the final film product that go further to show just how volatile the subject of Okazaki is and just how difficult a time I think Hara had in trying to control that uh, within the space of his documentary filmmaking. For example, um, Okazaki According to the production notes, Okazaki approached Hara one day and Okazaki said that uh, he was thinking about killing Koshimizu. All right, so Koshimizu is the main figure here who is uh, said to have given the order to execute uh, these two soldiers, uh, Yoshizawa and Nomura. And so he becomes a very uh, focus of much scrutiny and perhaps a lot of hatred on the part of Okazaki because Okazaki considers him to be the man primarily responsible for this great atrocity that is the, the deaths of these two soldiers that occurs after the war has, uh, has ended officially. Okay, so according to the production notes, Okazaki came to Hara and he said he was going to kill Koshimizu and that he wanted Hara to film the killing. Now, of course, Hara had nothing to do with the killing of or the planned killing, whatever it might have been of Koshimizu. And in fact, Koshimizu didn't get killed. Uh, but what you find out at the end of the film was that Okazaki, in fact, attacked um, uh, Koshimizu's son and that the son was in critical condition. Um, and then from there, uh, what we find out in a kind of epilogue to the film is that Okazaki was then convicted of this crime and he was sent to... Uh, serve a long sentence of hard labor uh, in 1987. So this is essentially showing uh, that I think Hara as the filmmaker was dealing almost on a daily basis with trying to control this very volatile subject matter and this very volatile subject that is um, uh, Kenzo Okazaki. And that Okazaki I think uh, went out of his way to perform acts on film that perhaps Hara uh, didn't have any direct uh, hand in planning uh, and that there were a lot of stunts in the film, a lot of publicity stunts that were shown in the film. But I think the argument can be had that uh, Hara was uh, filming them, but he was perhaps just as shocked as we are as we are watching them. And so there is some, I think, room for an exploration of the role of the filmmaker in the context of making a film like this and um, seeing what transpires and the kind of tactics that are employed. I mean, this is also true, for instance, where Okazaki employs actors in order to play the relatives of the dead soldiers when he goes to visit Koshimizu um, and also when he goes to visit Yamada at the end. He employs actors uh, and these actors are essentially his friends or and his wife. 
And so this is also perhaps a kind of a questionable uh, tactic uh, or, or morally questionable tactic because he's essentially employing lies in order to try to position himself in a certain way uh, in order to therefore hopefully get some kind of sympathy or get uh, some kind of feeling of guilt on the part of the people that he's interviewing and therefore that might uh, trigger them to provide more information than they would otherwise be willing to give had those uh, relatives not be present. So uh, we understand from the filmmaking that uh, while Hara didn't necessarily step in and stop any of this stuff, uh, he wasn't also necessarily directly involved with the planning of this kind of tactic. And so, and I think the production notes make, makes this much clearer as well, in that this is a film that we are seeing Okuzaki at work and we are basically at his mercy, as it were. And whenever there is resistance, there is a certain kind of tension that erupts. And we see this, or this is uh, expressed, expressed very well in the production notes. And so uh, if you have a chance, I really urge you to, to uh, read this as you watch this film. The other aspect, I think, which is very key, is the focus on the war and the atrocities, the specific atrocities that were committed. We are not dealing here with a documentary about the entirety of the Japanese wartime experience. We are not dealing here with every aspect of, of the Japanese army and military uh, machine. We are not dealing with the specific acts of the emperor per se, but we are dealing with very key moments at the tail end of the war or immediately after the war's end uh, that involved certain soldiers in this area of New Guinea. Deaths. And this is fused with Okuzaki's sense of, tr of wanting to mend or repair what he sees as being great injustices in the world. And when these two fuse and come together, we see this, this focus, this almost drive on Okuzaki's part to try to find the truth or to, to fix injustices in the world on the one hand, and then his experiences with the war and trying to, uh, and, and these mysterious deaths of these soldiers on the other hand. And so therefore, his focus therefore becomes on this thing. Uh, or on these uh, incidents, because there are more than one that are being discussed here. So with that uh, stage being set, then it becomes a, a, a interesting exploration as to contemporary Japan, at least Japan in the late, uh, in, the, in the 80s when this film is being shot, and certain individuals and how they are trying to deal with the aftermath of war or the post-war experience as it were some of the officers of the ex-sergeants are trying to essentially avoid sweep things under the rug some are trying to lie some want to forget some want to evade uh, and others try to give as much information as possible to her albeit they still try to uh, deflect their sense of guilt. For example, the the one of the, uh, the, the is I think he's described as being the commander of the unit, so uh, Takami, um, uh, who is seen twice in the film. And he's seen he's with a kind of a, a beige sweater, and uh, he seems kind of friendly outwardly, uh, but he doesn't seem to. Uh, be forthright with any kind of information at first and when he does give information later on he still tries to deflect guilt because he it is discovered that he is one of the of the I think it's five who was uh, actually part of the executing so he's one of the five sort of execution squad that executed these two soldiers Yoshizawa and Nomura and he says that he shot but he aimed to miss but uh, even Okazaki questions whether that is indeed true um, but um, in any way, uh, in any event, uh, Takami gives this information, which leads to trying to set up this, uh, essentially um, uh, trying to piece together what happened here. Um, but he is trying to provide information. Others, I think, are trying to evade information. There is a very powerful uh, uh, interview with one of the other ex-sergeants whose name is um, Hara. I'm sorry. Um, Yes, uh, Toshio Hara, 
and he is the one who remember we see him at a like an insurance at his company and he goes to a little office and he is sitting there on the floor with uh, the table and he's flanked by Okazaki and then uh, the brother of Nomura and then the sister of uh, Yoshizawa and their uh, the table and and he's very resistant to give any information he just and he says you know I just want you to know that uh, they were they were they 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 were innocent or something so he was trying to be uh, soothing and yet he would not give any information and he was very resistant and um, uh, he said you know don't uh, let's not uh, stir up the past and these sorts of things to evade uh, what he was trying to avoid, which is trying to give these people information about what happened and what he did, and he wouldn't say anything. Um, and it became a very frustrating part of the film. And yet there are others, like the medic, uh, Haraguchi, I think you know, he's the bald man, slightly corpulent man with the glasses, and he is taken to a nearby restaurant where he then talks to, again, the brother and the sister, and then um, uh, Okazaki, and also I think Okazaki's wife is there as well, but then he then reveals uh, to us for the first time anyway this idea that uh, the soldiers... Uh, the survivors, in order to survive, they killed and ate the other people and cannibalism and this whole deal, this whole discussion about uh, um, uh, white pigs and black pigs and uh, all this very frightening stuff that goes on. And, and that is uh, revealed, uh, but the, it's also revealed in a way where he is trying also to deflect uh, from his own potential guilt as well. And this occurs... Um, uh, in a very interesting process where the uh, the ex-sergeants and the medic and the doctor give slightly different differing accounts but it all sort of comes together in a picture um, and at the center of which is um, uh, Koshimizu and him giving the order for this execution why he gave the order and who gave the order and what where was he was he there was he not there he claims he wasn't there but um, Seo and um, uh, Takami and I think Haraguchi, but I, in particular Seo uh, claims that he was there. And so, and remember that scene with Seo when they visit him the second time, and it's like 5 a.m. in the morning, and they go into his house and it's cold, and they're sitting in the Japanese table kotatsu, and they're using mandarin oranges in order to display what the layout was when the execution occurred. Um, and and it, it's it's really quite fascinating because we have this exploration of war guilt, war crimes, and uh, remembrance of a very traumatic past, and uh, this is all very raw because it's very close to the this kind of how to deal with the the history of the past. And how does Japan deal with its own wartime history? Does it sweep the stuff under the rug? Uh, does it uh, try to avert uh, eyes to other places? Does it try to deflect attention and put it elsewhere and that sort of thing? Or does it try to aim at some kind of truth at to, as to what happened? Um, and I'm, uh, I don't know uh, if I have any very uh, comfortable answers to those questions, but... I think what this film is suggesting, at least on a micro level, as, as a kind of microcosm, that um, the hunt for the truth is a very difficult struggle, especially uh, when you're considering uh, not only uh, events that happened in the past, but these really sensitive and uh, quite horrific events that deal with uh, the Japanese experience in World War II. Then, as another part of the Japanese experiences expressed here, I would uh, also strongly urge that you look at this film when you have a chance and pay attention to those elements of, let's say, social niceties and the way in which Okazaki tries to um, use his essentially charm uh, and his politeness in order to get more information. And he's always, uh, for some people, he's very, at first he is very polite and he, he says the right words at first because Japanese as a language has a certain kind of formality to it. Uh, one needs to follow certain conventions of, of uh, politeness in order to make 
greetings and when one enters a house of another we have to say certain words in order to express a certain level of politeness but then he uses that as a way to enter um, and uh, once he does he then uh, gets to the heart of what he's trying to say and, and he really uh, provides words that are very biting and very almost mean um, and uh, very scathing uh, but he uses the social niceties in a way that I think is uh, very manipulative, but he uses it for uh, a purpose and effect, which is to get information or to, uh, to achieve some kind of goal. There are other elements of this, of Japanese society and Japanese niceness, I think, come through in a very fascinating manner. For instance, the way in which uh, early in the film we see uh, Okazaki talking with uh, one of the uh, superiors in the Hyogo police when uh, Okazaki says that he wants to go to Tokyo. Uh, he's seen talking with, uh, I think, a member of the Hyogo police, and the policeman is very polite. And uh, the, the production notes make note of this as well. Sometimes the police would call Okazaki sensei which is a, a kind of an honorific label, and uh, it, it it might have been, according to Hara, anyway, on the one hand, it might have been the police's way or the authorities' way of trying to um, uh, 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 get Okazaki on friendly terms so then Okazaki would then be more willing to provide them with more information. It might have been a purposeful tactic that way. But also, Hara seems to suggest that it, it was probably more meaningful than that as well, in that uh, there was a sense of respect uh, in this very odd way towards this man who is ultimately, at the time of shooting this film, a convicted criminal who is even then uh, expressing these notions of wanting to commit acts of basically criminal acts again or acts of aggression once again. Um, so just to the, the idea of the police and the relationship between the police on the one hand and Okazaki on the other and this kind of veneer of politeness is very fascinating to me and it, it, it goes towards an aspect I think of of Japanese culture. I mean it's not like everyone is nice but there are certain ways in which one must carry oneself uh, in certain aspects of society in order to achieve certain means uh, and even if those uh, even if to achieve certain ends excuse me and even if those means are seen to be say polite or nice, um, I would urge you to look at that again and just uh, see that as being another aspect of Japanese culture that is being explored here. Uh, the same is true for little details as well of, of Japanese culture, which I think are ver very fascinating. Um, the use of the mandarin oranges, uh, you know, the mandarin oranges, uh, they're known as mikan in Japanese. I mean, these are very common things that are eaten, especially in wintertime or cold winter months. And so to see them being used, it's like it's like a very uh, core fundamental image of, of um, Japan. And they're being used in this way to show how the execution took place. It's a really chilling image uh, for me. And uh, whenever I see it, I it really it, it chills me to the very core. So that those are examples, I think, of how this film also plays with or explores uh, s certain uh, elements, if you will, of of the picture of Japanese society. And I think that's a really great setup because Hara, as a filmmaker, he admits it himself. Hara, as a filmmaker, is one who wants to set his camera on uh, disruptions of that. He wants to tear that away and, and put his camera to it and see how people around will react to the core, to the center of, um, of these uh, uh, sort of ripples and rips and vibrations uh, that cause uh, chaotic uh, uh, ruptures in this otherwise um, uh, serene veneer that is Japanese society. And I think that's the whole point of Hara's filmmaking and that's the whole point of setting his camera on a an ultimate disruptor, if you will, that is Okazaki. I mean, when you put his camera on him, things around him just erupt in chaos. He goes in and he just it, it just explodes and, and to something that is uh, truly just unbelievable and so why not set one's camera to it right it must be seen in order to be believed and so 
uh, and and this is I think made even more impactful uh, by the fact that we are dealing with, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, perhaps a sort of a, a rigid. Uh, Japanese society, you know, a Japanese society that is focused on uh, the use of polite words and certain forms uh, with which one needs to operate in order to be able to uh, communicate with other uh, people within that society uh, and um, uh, and and the like. And so we have this almost clean image of Japan, which is being shaken up by the appearance of this disruptor, who is Kenzo Okazaki. So I think that is at the core, or at, at one of the cores, if you will. It's one of the uh, key aspects of this film that are being explored here very vividly by Hara in The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On. I could go on. Um, there are, again, so many surprises here that uh, are just so uh, wonderfully told and so skillfully told. It's a film that has uh, complete mastery over its form. It is a documentary. It also serves as a mystery, a murder mystery. Uh, we're trying to figure out, for instance, in the, in the center of the film about the execution of these two soldiers, what happened. And so it becomes almost like a Rashomon-like mystery where we have all the witnesses who are giving slightly different um, uh, testimonies about what happened so it becomes like a Rashomon like mystery but it's for real it's for real it actually happened and so we are not uh, and we don't get any flashbacks or anything we just get the testimony and even that not only is the testimony quite harrowing but the stories and the situations through which those testimonies were achieved are also quite harrowing so it's like a murder mystery, but it's also a, a uh, cinema verite documentary about uh, a real crime. And it's also a portrait of a man. Um, it's also, in many ways, it, it could be seen as almost like a propaganda piece for the things that he was espousing. Um, and But at the same time, it can also be seen as a very complex documentary that is multifaceted in that it is not a one-way piece of propaganda. Uh, and I, th I really stress that this film is not a piece of propaganda that purports to be in support of everything that Okuzaki is seen to be doing in this film. I think on the contrary, this film is obviously showing um, uh, warts and all, good points and bad points. And um, I think at the end, we as viewers are allowed to look at this film and find certain aspects of what uh, has been happening uh, as, as depicted in this film to be quite despicable uh, and very abhorrent and quite disgusting even. And I think we're allowed to feel that way. And uh, But I think that interpretation is, again, it's up to us, the viewers, which therefore makes this film very rich and complicated and thus a a really fascinating watch and one that I think should be watched by as many people as possible. The Emperor's Naked Army marches on. This is one of the supreme examples of Japanese cinema and it is a film about the past and the present. It is a film about history and about the search for truth and the the horrors, if you will, about those searches for truth and the, the kinds of frightening methods by which one tries to obtain these nuggets of truth, as it were. This is a dynamite film, and it is one of the greatest films in Japanese cinema, in my opinion. Once again, I hope it's seen by as many people as possible because it really needs as much attention that it deserves, and it deserves all the attention it can get. It is considered, I think, uh, Kazuhara's uh, one of his greatest works, and uh, it is so timeless. Uh, even now, watching it, it is incredibly powerful, and it has lost none of its edge. It is still frighteningly... Uh, relevant and it is such a masterwork of the form and the possibilities of that. My goodness, 
the Emperor's naked army marches on. This is a true masterpiece. Okay, my friends, uh, let me end right there. So, uh, I once again, I apologize. There are so many things that I wanted to talk about that I, I just didn't have time to. But if you want to talk about this film more, uh, please feel free to leave your thoughts and comments below. I'd love to hear what it is you have to say about this very interesting film. And once again, I also urge you to read up on the background of this film as possible. One source of that is the great book, which is, gr thank goodness, it's also available in an English translation. So, Camera Obtrusa, the action documentaries of, of Hara Kazuo. So, I strongly urge you to uh, take a look at the production history. And if you're interested, one way to do that would be to take a look at this book, which is in English, and it's great, and it's in by Hara in his own words, and he goes into lots of stuff. Oh, before I forget, there's one thing that he goes into here that I must admit uh, just broke my heart. It really broke my heart, and uh, it's talking about the film, and after it was made, the troubles that Hara and the crew and um, uh, producer, his producer and partner, Sachiko Kobayashi, had in trying to get this film shown in Japan. As you may uh, gather uh, the subject that is Okuzaki is such that because of his outward hatred towards the emperor and the emperor system, this film was uh, thought to be a film that might be reacted to against by the, or it, it, you know, it might be a film against which the right wing, the far right wing elements of Japan would. Uh, react to quite violently. And so there was, I think, a lot of fear that was expressed by uh, mainstream distributors in Japan, and which I think prevented the film from getting a, a proper uh, film uh, distribution release here in Japan. It is available on DVD now, and the film, as I understand it, was shown in certain theaters uh, every once in a while here in Japan, but there were never any uh, it, there was always a difficulty in trying to get this film, uh, quote unquote, properly distributed in Japan. Um, there is one story here that's on page 184 of the book, um, and let me just read it. It says, uh, By the way, the first place we took the film was to the Art Theater Guild. The people at ATG said, To tell you the truth, we really want to distribute it to our theaters, but as you know, Toho is our parent company. Your film wouldn't really fit the Toho brand. We want to do it, but you know. That's how we made our rounds. That's Hara's words. So this broke my heart because, um, again, I don't know the specific history of ATG and this film, The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On. I mean, I know ATG films. I know Art Theater Guild. I'm a huge fan of Art Theater Guild uh, and the films that they made. I think it's one of the great, great uh, uh, moments of cinematic renaissance in Japanese cinema history. That period from the late 1960s all the way up to the early 1980s is a real treasure trove of Japanese independent spirit um, cinema and that, that independent spirit that created some truly uh, masterful works. Uh, that is the ATG films. Really great. And so but to hear this from Hara saying that he couldn't even get ATG to support this film, I think, uh, is really, uh, uh, really broke my heart. It really did. And um, I should also mention, uh, while I'm here, that right, this film has a, a connection with uh, the great filmmaker Shohei Imamura. And in fact, the introduction between um, the 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 introduction between Okazaki and Hara occurred because Imamura introduced them. And so Imamura, uh, it was thought that perhaps Imamura actually might have been uh, planning to make a film about Okazaki, but in fact, you know, he in instead introduced Okazaki to Hara, and then the rest is, as they say, history. Uh, Hara does make a point also of, of suggesting in this book, uh, there is an issue, right? Okazaki was this really fascinating figure at the time, but uh, no, no other filmmaker would dare uh, touch this topic into making it into a film, but only Hara and uh, Sachiko Kobayashi and 
uh, you know, the fine folks uh, at their production company decided to go for it. And uh, according to Hara, he says that the reason why he decided to and other filmmakers didn't is uh, on page 149 of the book is because we're idiots. That's according to Hara, uh, because he, he's suggesting that he didn't realize the extent to which this was such a volatile subject matter, right? Because we are dealing with a figure that uh, could be seen to be someone on the far, far left, on the fringes of the left because of his hatred of the emperor and the emperor system. And so because of his far leftness, he would become, or the film would become a ripe target for the, the hatred and animosity of the far right uh, fringes of Japanese society and they are very vocal and a lot of people are very scared of that. Uh, but despite Hara's a very self-effacing comment, I think he is undoubtedly uh, one of the great creative geniuses because he put together this film and again, the more you delve into the details of the production history and the more you realize what kind of character Okazaki actually was, the more I think one can reach the conclusion that Hara was and his crew uh, was in, they were all so just geniuses. They were all geniuses in, in putting together this film as successfully as they did. So this is my long-winded way of saying this film is great and you should watch it and read it and read this book and watch the film again and read the book again and, and, and just uh, soak up all the details because it's so rich in detail and it's so uh, there, there are so there are little clues that are just uh, scattered all about uh, in certain words that are used certain looks glances that are given um, and then there are more clues here that are given here about how certain production history details came into being and how, how certain people were maneuvered and what they were thinking etc it becomes a fascinating portrait of this one aspect of Japanese society this is a great film the Emperor's Naked Army marches on Okay, my friends, thank you very much. So I'm very good. Once again, I'm sorry for uh, delaying the end of this video like this, but I hope you understand. And until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please, please, please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies, including the works of Kazuo Hara. So until we meet again, my friends, cheers.